I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the 10th chapter of the OpenStax Psychology Textbook. Today we'll be discussing emotion and motivation. And so in addition to those, we'll be talking about hunger and eating and sexual behavior. But let's get started by defining what motivation is. And that's the wants or needs that direct behavior towards a goal. And so we can talk about intrinsic motivation, which arises from internal factors, or extrinsic motivation, which arises from external factors. Now, intrinsic motivations give a sense of personal satisfaction, and extrinsic motivation comes from receiving something, like money, from other people. In reality, though, our motivations are often a mix of both intrinsic and extrinsic factors, but the nature of the mix of these factors might change over time. So I'll give a personal example of this. I started teaching uh, boy, over 25 years ago because I needed a job to buy things, you know, the things that everybody needs. And now, while I still get paid to work, I do it because I love it. And so it's gone from an extrinsic motivation to an intrinsic motivation. Important for what kind of job you choose is the over-justification effect, or OJE. And this is the idea that receiving some sort of extrinsic reinforcement, such as money, for engaging in behaviors that we enjoy leads to those behaviors being thought of as work, and they no longer provide that same enjoyment. And so this is like teaching. So if you want to work with children, you should probably have your own rather than go into teaching, because if you teach, let's say, primary school uh, because you love children, because they're paying you to teach, you'll begin to enjoy it less. And so you need to remember the, the three best things about being a teacher, June, July, and August. Now, other studies suggest that intrinsic motivation may not be so vulnerable to the effects of extrinsic reinforcements. And in fact, reinforcements such as verbal praise might actually increase intrinsic motivation. Also, tangible rewards like money may be more harmful to intrinsic motivation than intangible rewards, such as praise. Students are more likely to be intrinsically motivated if, uh, to learn if they feel a sense of belonging and respect in the classroom. No surprise there. Now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about some theories of motivation, and we'll start with uh, instinct theory and drive theory. From a biological perspective, an instinct is a species-specific pattern of behavior that is not learned. And so William James, who's an early psychologist, and he's pictured there to the right, he proposed the instinct theory of motivation. But people fought, as is people at the time, they fought over the exact definition of what an instinct is. So for example, a mother defending her child, is that instinctual or is that learned? How about hunting? Um, your book also gives the example of licking sugar. Uh, it's delicious. Drive theory says that deviations from homeostasis create physiological needs, and the psychological drive directs behavior to meet the need and return to homeostasis. So for example, we eat in order to reduce our hunger drive. We might even lick sugar to reduce our hunger drive, but then we'll probably get hungry again soon after that. Eating actually becomes a habit. And so uh, personally, I eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. An extension of drive theory considers the levels of arousal as potential motivations. So if we're in, un in an under aroused state, this leads to boredom. And if we're over aroused, we try to reduce our arousal. So you might ask, what is the optimal level of arousal? And this is where the Yerkes Dodson law comes in. And they say that the optimal arousal depends on the complexity and difficulty of the task to be performed. So simple tasks are performed best under high arousal and complex tasks under low arousal. Self-efficacy is an individual's belief in her own capability to complete a task, and that may include a previously successful completion of the exact same or similar task. Albert Bandura, who's pictured off to the right, 
thought that self-advocacy plays an important role in motivating behavior. And he argued that motivation comes from expectations that we have about the consequences of our behavior. So that if you believe you can achieve at the highest level, you're more likely to take on challenging tasks and you won't be deterred when you face setbacks. Let's discuss Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I think for the fifth time so far in this book. Now this spans different motives from the biological to the individual to the social, and they're often put in terms of a pyramid. So at the base are physiological needs necessary for survival. So like food, water, shelter, and warmth. In the middle are needs for security and safety. And so that's your need to be loved and have friends and family. And at the top is self-actualization, which is achieving your full potential. Maslow later proposed self-transcendence, which is striving for meaning and purpose beyond concern for oneself. What are the physiological mechanisms of hunger? Well, your stomach contracts when it's empty, causing hunger pangs and chemical messages to go to the brain to signal time to eat. The pancreas and liver generate chemical signals that induce hunger when your blood glucose levels drop. Satiation is when you feel full. And so fullness and satisfaction um, is regulated by many physiological mechanisms. And this tells you you've had enough time to stop eating. Food in your gastrointestinal tract uh, also sends the same signals and leptin is released by your fat cells. So body weight is impacted by a number of factors such as your genes, uh, interacting with your environment, your caloric intake, etc. So if your caloric intake is more than your use, your body store excess energy in the form of fat. A metabolic rate is the amount of energy that's expended in a given period of time, and there's tremendous variability between people. So some people run at a much higher metabolic rate. A theory for how our weight is determined is what's, uh, or a, a theory is set point theory. And this theory says that each individual has an ideal body weight that is resistant to change. And this is why dieting can be so difficult because efforts to alter weight are countered. And so uh, your body compensates essentially through your metabolism. Uh, this is an awesome theory and it makes a lot of intuitive sense, but it hasn't uh, received a lot of research support. What about obesity? Well, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention consider an adult with a body mass index between 25 and 29.9 to be overweight. A BMI of 30 or higher is considered obese and a BMI over 40 is morbid obesity. The health consequences of being obese are uh, you have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, stroke, type two diabetes, it's diabetes, but I like to say it like Wilfred Brimley, liver disease, sleep apnea, colon cancer, breast cancer, infertility, and arthritis. One way to um, try to correct obesity is through bariatric surgery. And this is a type of surgery aimed at weight reduction by modifying the gastrointestinal system to reduce the amount of food that can be eaten and or limiting how much of the digestive food can be absorbed. What about eating disorders? Well, we're gonna talk about uh, bulimia, binge eating, and anorexia. So bulimia nervosa is when people engage in binge eating behavior that's followed by purging. So that could be vomiting, it could be laxatives, or it could be excessive exercise. And the health consequences for that are things like kidney failure, heart failure, and tooth decay. Binge eating disorder is a lot like bulimia. So there's binging, but there's no purging. And so binges are followed by distress, guilt, and embarrassment. And it's actually now a DSM recognized disorder. Anorexia nervosa is a very serious condition. It's when the maintenance of body weight is well below the average, and that's done through starvation or excessive exercise. Uh, people with anorexia uh, often have a distorted body image and they view themselves as being overweight even when they're not. Um, women between the ages of 15 and 19 are the most at risk for anorexia nervosa and the health consequences are the same as bulimia, but they also include death. And so it's a, it's a very serious um, disorder. 
Sexual behavior in the brain. Well, what are the important areas of the brain? Well, really the whole brain, but specifically the hypothalamus. And lesions here can completely disrupt a male rat's ability to engage in sexual behavior. That poor rat. Limbic structure, structures such as the amygdala, uh, if they're damaged, that leads to a decreased sexual motivation in both male and female rats. So at this point, you might say, hey, this might be true for rats, but can you draw some parallels for humans? And that's a really good question. The closest thing that we can say, uh, at least right now with the, the current research, is that sexual motivation for men and women varies as a function of testosterone levels. Alfred Kinsey initiated really the first large-scale survey research on human sexuality. And he published this uh, first in 1948 with sexual behavior in the human male, and then in 1953, sexual behavior in the human female. Some of his discoveries were that women are interested and experienced in sex, that both males and females masturbate without going blind, actually with no adverse consequences, and that homosexual acts are fairly common. Now, for the time, this was pretty sensational stuff. And it's been very influential in shaping research on human sexual behavior. He also developed the Kinsey scale, which is used to identify a person's sexual orientation. And that's an individual's emotional and erotic attractions to same-sex individuals, which would be homosexual, opposite-sex individuals, which is heterosexual, or both, which is bisexual. Masters and Johnson, that they're pictured there, uh, Masters is off to the left and Johnson is to the right. They recorded physiological variables for nearly 10,000 sexual acts. So they didn't do survey research like Kinsey. They actually had people come into their lab and either have sex or masturbate. From this research, they developed uh, their the sexual response cycle, which is excitement, plateau, orgasm, and then resolution. This is followed by a refractory period, which is a period of time that follows orgasm, during which an individual cannot orgasm again. Now that lasts longer for men, and it's longer uh, takes longer for men as they age. Also, they collected important information about intercourse and reproductive anatomy. So for example, they had found proof for multiple orgasms in women and what the average penis length was in men. While the majority of people are heterosexual, a sizable minority of people, three to 10%, identify as homosexual or bisexual. Now we've already talked about sexual orientation, but for years, researchers looked for clues to sexual orientation in family backgrounds or life experiences. And they basically found nothing. And so research evidence suggests that sexual orientation has a biological component to it and that it's not a choice and uh, further, that it's not alterable through some sort of conversion therapy. Now, many people conflate sexual orientation with gender identity, and they're related, but they're actually very different issues. So gender identity is one's, one sense of being a male or a female. And for most people, their gender identity corresponds to their biological sex. But when it doesn't, they experience gender dysfor dysphoria. And this is a diagnostic category in the DSM-5 that describes individuals who do not identify as the gender that most people would assume that they are. Many people who are gender dysphoric live their lives in ways that are consistent with their own gender identity. They may undertake transgender hormone therapy, which is an attempt to make their bodies look more like the opposite sex. And they also um, you may use elective surgery to alter their external genitalia. Well, let's switch gears again and talk about emotion. So this is a subjective state of being that we often describe as our feelings. So let's talk about our feelings. Now, when we discuss emotion, we're making a distinction between emotion and mood. And mood tends to be uh, more prolonged and less intense than emotion. The components of emotion are physiological arousal, psychological appraisal, and subjective experiences. And we're gonna talk about four different theories of emotion here. And they're really pretty similar. 
And so I'll, I'll try to give you an example that ties all these together. So the James Lang theory, not that that's uh, they got a U in there that um, shouldn't be there, says that emotions arise from physiological arousal. So if I see a snake, my heart rate goes way up and then I run away and then I'm scared. And so uh, I'm scared because I run away. The Cannon Bard theory says that physiological arousal and emotional experience occur simultaneously and independently. So according to Cannon Bard, uh, I'm simultaneously feeling scared and experience an, experiencing an increased heart rate when I see the snake. The Schachter Singer two-factor theory, which I always it, I think of it as the Schachter two-factor theory because then it rhymes. Most good theories should rhyme says that both physiological arousal and a cognitive appraisal occur and that events are interpreted in context. So Schachter Singer would say that we experience a heart rate increase and we attribute it to the snake. And so uh, we're like, well, why, why is my heart um, rate going up? And then you're like, well, you make a cognitive appraisal of saying, well, it's because of that snake there. So arousal is the engine, okay? Feeling aroused and your heart rate increasing but cognition's the steering wheel. It tells you why you feel that way. And that's why context is important. An example I always think of with the Schachter Singer um, theory is a roller coaster. Because some people absolutely love roller coasters. They find them thrilling. I find them thrilling. But other people find them terrifying. And so they really don't like it. I enjoy driving fast too, so I kind of make my own roller coaster. But here's the point is you have the exact same stimuli, but some people find it thrilling and some people find it terrifying. And so you have similar arousal and then a cognitive appraisal that either says this is thrilling or this is frightening. Cognitive mediational theory says that the emotion is determined by the appraisal of the stimulus. Now you might ask yourself, how is that different from the Schachter-Singer theory? And I've asked myself that question. Well, in the cognitive mediational theory, cog, uh, the appraisal precedes the cognitive label. And so you might get scared if you hear a loud noise. And so you don't um, know necessarily what it is, but you know that it's bad. And so, you know, maybe it's zombies or something, but that's actually doing a cognitive appraisal. How about the amygdala and the hippocampus? Well, research, researchers use the amygdala to study fear and anxiety. And the basolateral complex is a dense connection of, it has a variety of sensory, uh, it's a dense connection to a variety of uh, sensory areas of the brain. And it's critical both in classical conditioning and attaching emotional value to learning and memory. The central nucleus plays a role in attention and it has connections with the hypothalamus and the brainstem areas to regulate autonomic nervous system and your endocrine system. The hippocampus is linked to mood and anxiety disorders and individuals with PTSD show reductions in volume in parts of their hippocampus. Facial expression and emotions. Well, we can discuss cultural display roles, and this is a collection of a culturally specific standards that govern the types and frequencies of displays of emotions that are acceptable. So for example, in the United States, you can express negative emotions like fear and disgust, both when you're alone or with if you're around other people. But apparently in Japan, it's uh, feelings of uh, fear or disgust are only uh, culturally appropriate um, when you're by yourself. And so uh, you wouldn't show that when uh, other people are around. Activity in the facial muscles involved in generating expressions is universal and there's substantial evidence for seven universal emotions. And these are emotions that other people recognize too. So happiness, surprise, sadness, fright, disgust, contempt, and anger. The facial feedback hypothesis says that facial expressions influence our emotions. So uh, are cartoons funnier when there's a pencil in your teeth or are you less depressed when they Botox you so you can't frown? Maybe, that's the best I can say. Body language, this is the expression of emotion in terms of body position or movement, and we're sensitive to it even if we don't realize it. Well, 
all of your problems, or at least all of your APA style problems, can be solved through my APA style book. So when you want to learn to write co correctly or write right, consult my book and videos on Learn APA Style, which are about writing in psychology and the social sciences. Have a great day, and thanks for listening.